In Homer's Iliad, the pantheon of Greek gods travel to the remotest part of the world they can think of for a banquet. The entire round trip takes the gods two weeks. This remote destination, a full week by whatever means the gods took to travel from Mount Olympus, was Ethiopia. This indicates the spatial relationship in Greek consciousness between Greek and Ethiopian. In fact, the Iliad and later the Odyssey describe Ethiopia as being the remotest place on earth far from Greek civilization. Early biblical references to Cush also conceptualize Ethiopia as a distant place. Ethiopia is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Cush. Both mean something akin to darkness, dark-faced, and in some translations, burnt face. These civilizations were conceptualized as being remote but also of great interest. This is perhaps best showcased in the story of the biblical Queen of Sheba, for whom the local Ethiopians have the name Kandake Makeda. According to the accounts of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Sheba and Solomon's son, Menelik I, was the founder of the Salomic dynasty in Ethiopia. Menelik, as the legend goes, also brought the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia. This cements, at least in a Christian narrative of history, Ethiopia's place as a foundational world civilization. The Ethiopians were seen by the Greeks to be favored by the gods. Homer calls them blameless in the Iliad. In some translations, the word used is matchless. In Greek mythology, the Ethiopians were in fact closer to the gods than were the Greeks. The Iliad is not the only mention of Ethiopia and Africa in Greek epics and mythology. In some versions of the Trojan War story, Helen does not go to Troy, she instead finds safety in Africa, where she hides. Ethiopia also features in the Theogony, a genealogy of the Greek gods and an account of the creation of the world by Hesiod. As well as evidence within Greek epics and mythology, there have also been artifacts uncovered from Bronze Age Greek civilizations found in Egypt, in particular the Minoans and Mycenaeans. From all this, we can safely assume that Ethiopia was well known to Greek civilization as early as the Bronze Age, circa 12th century BCE. Not only that, but African civilizations were relevant at least in the Greco-Roman world. A lot of ancient African history remains underappreciated and understudied. People may be vaguely aware of the Phoenicians, Carthaginians and ancient Egypt, all great civilizations that achieved incredible things but probably have little knowledge of ancient African history beyond that. This video will concentrate on the Kingdom of Aksum, which was a world power in the 1st century CE and lasted until sometime in the 10th century CE. Aksum is a great case study of African civilization because we have written records, but also because it was a great civilization that existed at the same time as the Roman, Byzantine, and Persian empires. A Persian Gnostic known as Mani, who lived during the 3rd century CE, said there were four great civilizations, Rome, Persia, Celios, and Aksum. Aksum is also perfect for this series on Islam and Africa because Islam entered Africa through Aksum. Aksum existed roughly where modern-day Eritrea and Ethiopia are. These boundaries expanded and contracted with time. This also demonstrates how inextricably linked conceptions of ancient and by implication modern Africa are to the specific geography of Ethiopia slash Kush slash Nubia. This certainly contributes to our intellectual impoverishment regarding African history. Some historians and archaeologists of Aksum have identified the foundations of an Aksumite kingdom as early as the 4th century BCE. To be sure, this is not the beginning of the Aksumite kingdom, it was the development of culture that allowed the Aksumite kingdom to eventually flourish beyond its neighbors at the time. According to these scholars, the Aksumite culture took a different course of development to its neighbors. David Philipson, who takes a different approach, identifies the sites where Aksum was founded and grew from. He explains that the early community that would eventually become Aksum moved from their original location to what would become Aksum due to need 
grazing lands for their cattle, communication links with their neighbours and other considerations. Philipson impresses on his reader how important it was that the early Aksumite community did not just move but undertook what was more akin to an expansion. The sites of the Aksumite genesis were not abandoned, but both sites continued to function as one extended community. Early Aksumite polities began to form around these settlements with distinct forms of pottery, buildings and burial sites. From examining this information, archaeologists have been able to conclude that early Aksumite settlements were probably formed as chiefdoms and had at least three social classes. These were likely chiefs and nobles, lesser nobles and the ordinary people. In the space of a few hundred years, Aksum became a major regional and global power. It was without a doubt the only powerful state in the region that could play on the same stage as the Romans and Persians. An inscription by an Aksumite king, possibly from the 3rd century CE, talks about all his regional conquests. This unknown king conquered numerous local tribes and had conquered tribes in the Arabian Peninsula. The king extracted tax from those he conquered and signed treaties. Aksum had contact and engagement with both the Eastern and Western world. There are many references in Greek and Roman texts to Ethiopia and Ethiopians. This wide reach was reflected in the culture of Aksum, which borrowed aspects of other civilizations, for example South Arabian forms of inscriptions or the use of Greek on coins. Aksum was able to interact with the rest of the world because of its great location right on the coast of the Red Sea. As described earlier, it was also on the periphery of the known world as far as the Greeks and Romans were concerned. In that sense, Aksum was a conduit between East and West. The early Aksum kingdom was said to have two ports, Samadhi and Agilis. They were not just ports, but important stops on trade routes. It was common for Aksumites to live along the trade routes and even police it at times. Arab historian Badawi said that during the time of the Prophet there was a community of Ethiopian Christians that lived in Mecca. Part of this community was responsible for the protection of the Meccan Aksumite trade route. In fact, the Aksumite navy was stationed at the port of Adulis. A major part of the navy's role was to protect the trade routes. Aksum was a major producer and exporter of ivory, something it had in abundance in its borders. Other things that were exported from Aksum were numerous animal skins, such as hippopotamus and monkey. There were also tortoise shells and slaves. A Greek trader known as Cosmas makes a reference in his opus, Christian Topography, to camel leopards in the Aksum court. These were giraffes, which Coma says could only be found in Aksum. Other than animal products, there were vegetables and spices. Imports came from as far afield as Italy or India and included things like wine, cloth, iron, lace and muslin. Aksumite gold has also been found in Sri Lanka and India. Aksumite had diplomatic links with a number of different civilizations, most importantly their links with Byzantium and Rome. Through their shared faith, the Aksumites and the Byzantines always had very good relations. There were reported to be Aksumite ambassadors to Rome as early on as the 3rd century CE. According to archaeologist Mark Rose, Aksumite representatives were present when Aurelian 274 CE paraded the captured queen of the Palmyrians, Zenobia, through Rome. Romans too travelled to Aksum as is shown by the story of Frumentius. The Byzantine Empire also sent support as diplomatic missions to the Aksumites during the Himyarite, which was undertaken by the Ethiopians to establish Christianity in Yemen. This would eventually lead to the ascension of an Aksumite general known as Abraha as King of Yemen. Diplomatic ties also existed with Mecca. During the reconstruction of the Kaaba, a man called Bakum was enlisted to help rebuild it with materials the Qureshis were unfamiliar with. Islamic sources usually suggest Bakum was Roman, but as Stuart Munro Hay points out, the material and architecture were typical of Aksum, particularly their religious buildings.
The Aksumite kingdom was a monarchy, the Aksumite king was the Negus. In some inscriptions, such as Negus Ezena, 4th century, the designation is King of Kings. Some historians have suggested this may mean that while the Negus was the overall ruler of Aksum, with a number of subordinates had been conquered. In Ezena's case, the inscriptions read Himyar, Raiden, Saba, Salhan, Seyamo, Bega, Kasu. Interestingly, some inscriptions have also used the designation MLK for the King of Kings. Archaeologists have uncovered paved roads in the Aksumite Kingdom. These would have been for public use to reach places internally in the Kingdom. Internally in the Kingdom, infrastructure was key to unifying the different tribes into one unified Kingdom. Ethiopia at the time was extremely diverse culturally, linguistically and ethnically. The Aksumite kings were able to successfully integrate conquered tribes both politically and within the Aksumite zeitgeist by building churches and other architecture that was indicative of Aksum. This led to political and cultural participation by discrete tribes that were nonetheless a part of the Aksumite whole. As is seen with the case of the Zagwe dynasty, these peripheral tribes became well integrated into the structures of Aksumite power. Aksumite artisans produced stonework, ivory, metalwork and pottery, wood and even glass. Aksum stonemasons were renowned for their production of stelae, which were large stone columns that were used for marking graves and commemorating nobles and kings. One 57-ton steel was taken by Mussolini when Italy colonized Ethiopia. It was eventually returned and needed to be transported in three parts. A steel was discovered by the Church of Zion that weighed 550 tons and was 108 feet tall. The production of stelae was prolific that there remain to this day over a thousand stelae in the city of Aksum. These steel would have been quarried locally. Stone also had a variety of other uses, such as dice. There were ivory carving workshops located in the kingdom with tools designed specifically for carving ivory. Ivory carving became so intricate that artisans were able to carve animals onto ivory. Ivory was also used to make chairs with ornate carvings. Metals that the Aksumites used include gold, silver, bronze and brass, as well as iron and copper. Uses were varied, metals could be used decoratively as tools or as coinage. Gold was even used as thread. The evidence suggests that artisans were highly advanced in their work with metal. Aksumite pottery was all handmade with technology that was developed in Aksum. Most of the official texts that survive, including books and inscriptions, are either Greek or Gies script and Gies had two further scripts. The Gies Assam derived script was written both left to right and right to left and contained only consonants in its written form. Gies was likely to first be written around the 19th century BCE. As historian Tadase Tamrat points out though, Aksum and its surrounding areas were very linguistically diverse, something that Tamrat's study of Gies texts has uncovered. Tamrat also argues that ancient Agor may have been the substratum of Ethiosemitic languages. There are Agor loanwords found in Gies. Unlike Gies and Greek though, it was oral and had no script that had survived. Gies loaned several words to Arabic. There are several early Islamic scholarly works that dedicate chapters to these words. Greek was used in some official uses at different times. There are surviving inscriptions and texts in Greek and even coins. Philipson argues that Greek was used primarily by those who were working with foreigners, traders, ambassadors and so on. Greek was eventually phased out of use in Aksum from the 5th century onward. Christianity entered the Aksumite Kingdom sometime in the 4th century CE. Evidence suggests that in around 440 CE, the kings formally adopted Christianity. Up until that time, Ezena, who was the first known Aksumite king to have adopted Christianity, had conflicting inscriptions in Gies and Greek. 
Some indicated that he had converted and others, primarily the Guise, suggested that he was still an adherent of a polytheistic religion which existed throughout Ethiopia and South Arabia. A number of sources that repeat an early account by Rufinus Achilia in his Ecclesiastical History, Achilia mentions that three travelers from Syria became shipwrecked on the Red Sea. The two surviving travelers, Frumentius and Odysseus, were taken to the king of Axum, who employed them. After this king had passed away and a new king was appointed, Frumentius traveled to Alexandria to have a bishop appointed over the small community of Christians, who were mostly foreigners, in Axum. The patriarch in Alexandria appointed Frumentius as the bishop. Frumentius on his return began to proselytize and managed to attract a large number of converts. Aksumite Christianity very early on began to follow a different path from that of Roman Christianity, much to the dismay of the Roman Emperor Constantius II. This was in part influenced by the Patriarch in Alexandria, Athanasius, who had strange relationships with the imperial authorities. This led to an Aksumite Ethiopian church being instituted with its own liturgical texts in Giz as well as its own mythology. The Orthodox Ethiopian Church has its own saints, nine of them, which it venerates in texts called Gadlat, Lives. Another important text with regard to Christianity in Aksum is the Kebra Negast, which discusses themes of the Old Testament. Significantly, it also reiterates that the King of Ethiopia is senior to the rulers of Rome and Constantinople. The Kebra Negast is also where the myth of Sheba and Menelik I is found.